in this PowerPoint that I'm about to present, which is a series of images courtesy um, online resources, so I'm grateful they're not mine, they're not owned by me or the Awakened Cell Foundation. I would like to take you on a journey from the transcendent to the imminent, the non-manifest, the manifest aspect of Ganesha. So every time I say next, Ishani, you can move the slide. Next. Would you like the next slide now? Beautiful. <laughs> what an imagination. If, if this is beyond imagination, Ganesha is beyond imagination. Ganesha is Ishvara. Then we came up with some nice imagination. It definitely uh, does not allow the ordinary state of mind to engage with the deity of Ganesha. Either we will dismiss it as a joke, a cartoon, or when we start understanding it, then we will deeply be entranced by its symbolism. Some of the names of this deity are Ganesha, which is one of the most popular names. And Ganesha comes from Gana plus Isha. Isha is Ishwara. And Gana means leader of all the forces, the Ganas. The Ganas means every power in the world. So, Ganesha. Vinayaka simply means leader of the Sattva, leader of good forces. Vigna Harta. Vigna means obstacle. Harta means remover. So, you might come across a prayer to Vigna Harta. That also means to Ganesha. You might come across Lambodara. Lambodara means the big bellied one. And the big belly is, again, a symbol of being able to hold everything in the belly. Our galaxies and billions of galaxies are held in this belly. Ekadanta means one tusk. Uh, typically, elephants have two tusks. But this elephant-headed deity has one tusk because it is said that when it was time to compose the Mahabharata, in which the Bhagavad Gita lives, about a million verses, it was too daunting a task for the poet Vyasa. So he went to the deity of Brahma. If you remember, we spoke about Brahma is the creative principle, the generative principle. Vishnu is a sustaining principle. And... Maheshwara or Shiva is the annihilating principle. And in this, in, in mythology, we understand that as characters. So Vyasa went to Brahma. Brahma said, um, let us ask Ganesha what to do because Ganesha is the obstacle. Remover. So then Ganesha broke off his tusk to use as a pen to become the scribe. And Ganesha just said, just don't pause. So there was stream of consciousness of Vyasa who dictated the biggest epic possible, inhumanly possible, because the writer, the scribe was Ganesh. That's, what does that mean again? It means that whenever you take up any task which requires intellect, which requires the use of the mind, which requires wisdom, because in the one million verses, there is not one verse that takes humanity downwards. Every verse is filled with the light of dharma and moksha, um, ethics and freedom. Then, uh, and Lord Ganesha himself helped with that process. That means that whenever we are about to, in my case, start a book, every time I start a chapter, every time I start writing in the morning, anytime I have to write an email, which whose purpose is to clarify and bring more peace in the world or more peace to the person who needs it. Well, let's remember Ganesha. So that perspective. 
as you can see in this photo itself, he's holding on to a lotus, he's holding on to a bowl of ladus or sweets, brown sweets. There is a mouse looking adorably at Ganesha. So we'll understand all this symbolism because we can only understand the formulas through symbols. This is a very interesting conception of empirical divinity. We it's not just a person divinized, but it's the symbols of the absolute symbolize, and that's why we take creative license here. Next. Our story begins with a formless. Formless consciousness, sat the universe is teeming with existence before this world existed. And even when this world goes kaput, existence will always be there. This is a divine existence. This, this, this existence is not static existence. Every particle of it is intelligent. It is this original intelligent existence that transforms into a rock, a sand, a piece of glass, a plant, an animal, so that existence itself, that original existence was a matter of great deliberation for the seers of the Vedas. They were more fascinated by what became everything. And if everything is reduced to something, what is that? That is Brahman. Sat, Chit and Ananda. If we take away all the outer manifestations and if we go deep within our own selves, like the yogis did, then they found that they felt happy. I mean, typically, if you take away my favorite books or if you take away my favorite, probably, Murti of Ganesha, I may not be that happy. But somehow in this voluntary renunciation, take away the books, Take away the props of religion. Take away the murti. Take away, I'm just sitting, sitting, sitting. And you hit happiness. That means the nature of this deep original consciousness within us is ananda or happy. So we begin here, unmodified. Next. And then brilliantly so. The sages, the Vedic seers, conceived of, as we start going towards from absolute to relative plane, we started imagining it broken up into Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha is the divine masculine principle. Prakriti is the divine feminine principle, also known as Shiva and Shakti. And... Uh, they are synonyms, really. In some yogic scriptures, Purusha Prakriti, in some Shiva Shakti. What is this divine masculine and feminine? This is not based on genitals. This is still a very high level conception. Purusha was the pure consciousness, Satchitananda, and Prakriti was then the power of Satchit Ananda to transform into the billions of planets and stars and galaxies and worlds and beings. So Prakriti cannot be without Purusha and Purusha cannot be expressed without Prakriti. So they are equal. Prakriti is not a derivative of Purusha. Prakriti and Purusha are both Satchit Ananda in the absolute state Purusha in the in the manifested state. Next. In fact, as we started using our imagination to imagine Purusha Prakriti or Shiva Shakti, we imagined that if there was a creation if there was indeed a supreme being, then it must be half Purusha, half Prakriti, half Shiva, half Shakti. Must be so. 
this is really original, this thinking. We don't see human beings who are, you know, completely half and half. Yes, maybe it's, there is a sexual tendency. But we're not talking about gender here. We're talking about principle here. And this is the beautiful deity itself known as Shiva Shakti or Ardhanareshwar. Ardhanareshwar. And I have discussed about Ardhanareshwara in Roar Like a Goddess in the intro chapter itself. There is a hymn to Ardhanareshwara in it, so you can go back and enjoy it. So how closely intertwined are the principles of Purusha Prakriti Shiva Shakti when we start coming into the relative plane? Next. When we saw the Ardhanareshwara earlier, we saw it meditating because meditation is an activity of pure consciousness, just being. But then, as we are continuing to understand the relative plane, we also imagine the universe as a collaboration of a dance between Shiva Shakti or Purusha Prakriti. A beautiful dance. This dance has given birth to the universe. And so we see that Prakriti is, uh, of course, more dynamic. And But she's dancing because of the proximity to Shiva, because the consciousness is uh, coming alive in Prakriti, and Prakriti is giving expression to the consciousness. Next. This is a more abstract art, and now we will see a more definite presentation thanks to Pinterest. So it's such a beautiful presentation of Shiva Shakti with multiple hands. In fact, in the Rig Veda, we have a beautiful hymn called the Purusha Sukta, where we say that the Purusha, the Shiva, has thousands of hands and thousands of legs and thousands of faces and People don't understand what it means, but what it means is that it is Shiva Shakti is dwelling in all of us. The spirit principle and the, the being principle and the becoming principle. The stillness principle and the dynamic principle. The masculine principle and the feminine principle. This is a beautiful image of the universe occurring through this collaboration of consciousness and energy, because of our Shiva and Shakti. Even in quantum physics, we come across energy as the, the spandana, the vibration, but what quantum physics lacks is the Shiva principle of pure beingness, pure consciousness. They've arrived at that original vibration that at, at the beginning of the universe there was only a vibration. They've come to that conclusion in the string theory. But they've still not, they've discovered Ma Shakti, but they've not discovered Shiva as yet. Continue, please. Next. We now start imagining Shiva Shakti as the foundational essence of not only the universe, but each and every particle of the universe is imbued with Shiva Shakti. If you see the trident next to Shiva, often um, the deities have a trident. So now we are seeing symbols here. We are seeing the trident and these three spears of the trident. The, the center is the tallest, represents sattva. That is how we should lead our life. Rajas and tamas are smaller. And sattva is leading rajas and tamas. So you can have passion of rajas and you can have the dullness and sleepiness and the... <coughs> attachments of tamas as long as they are regulated by sattva 
You see a lotus on one hand, which represents enlightenment. You see a snake around Shiva Shakti. Snake represents being willing to being willing to carry the poisonous, difficult difficulties around you almost like an ornament, not its victim. We see a damaru or a tiny drum which is attached to the trident. And it is said that when Shiva dances, that dance is known as Tandava, T-A-N-D-A-V-A. And when I discuss the deity of Shiva, we'll go into the Tandava. But the Tandava is, um, when he plays the drums, then the, uh, the sounds of the Sanskrit alphabet started coming out. Ka, 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 ka. A, A, E, E, O. So these alphabets started coming out. Cha, cha, ja, ja, na. So it is the drum that's playing because of which the Sanskrit sounds came out. That's why when you listen to Sanskrit, um, the gunas change and it becomes sattva. That is why in the Sanskrit language, there is no swear word. That is why in the Sanskrit language, almost every statement is an upliftment because it's it, it has divine origins. So you're seeing the beginning of symbols here. Symbols have a meaning. They're not random art. And you see the whirling cosmos behind the Shiva Shakti, which represents Brahman, the formless Ishwara. And you see the Shiva Shakti as form Ishwara. So I really like this image. Next. And now we have, believe it or not, we have conception of galaxies, uh, parallel galaxies, multiple uh, lokas or multiple realms of existence of beings who don't look like us and have different bodies and different aspirations and different karmic journeys. These are described in Vedic texts. And yet at the center of all of this is the Shiva Shakti principle. Shiva Satchit Ananda Shakti principle is imbuing Satchit Ananda with um, um, two extra qualities, Nama, name, and Rupa, form. So Satchit Ananda is formless, but when you give it Rupa, form, it gains form and it gains a name. This is a particle of sand. This is a blade of grass. This is spectacles. This is a drop of water. So everything has form and everything has a name. So we are now coming into the world. Next. So now that we are emerging from the absolute into the relative, Please remember, we are not descending. We are simply making horizontal generates from absolute to relative, relative to absolute. So now the imagination was soaring of the ancient seers and they started imagining Shiva and Shakti's wedding, that Shakti and Shiva met. So Shakti came to him as Sati, then as Parvati, and then she has many, she herself becomes Kali, she is Durga, she is all the nine goddesses of Navratri, because you know, she is becoming, so she can take many forms, but in every form she finds Shiva. And so we, we, we have stories of their love. And we are often shown that Shiva is meditating. He doesn't open his eyes for millions of years. But Shakti ensures he opens his eyes. And Shakti, there is this imagination of Shiva being the wild meditating yogi wearing leopard skin and snakes around him and living in the... And if he ever shows up in the earth, because he's, you know, Satchitananda, so it's like, okay, I'll just be in some remote mountain called Kailasha, but 
Shakti in her in her deity form as Parvati, she domesticates him. Next, just like our soul within is wild, it's free. It doesn't belong to any one body, but the body domesticates it. The mind domesticates our Atma and makes it deal with peace and war, battles and romances in earthly life. Never forget Shiva Shakti is that. So we have their wedding celebrated. We have mythology connected with it, which I will share again and again during Navratri and future books. Continuing forward, the enchanting images are just very grateful to the anonymous artists who are creating these digital art pieces. They must be so blessed because I'm feeling like they really did something. And here we have next the children. What will Shiva and Shakti create? We have it. Little baby Ganesha and baby Skanda. Divine parents, divine children. Shiva, consciousness, Shakti, power. Skanda, pure courage. Pure heroism. And Ganesha represents wisdom. And, and through wisdom. It's not a physical removal of obstacles, but through knowledge, through wisdom, the removal of obstacles. So this is a very favorite family. We will share this PowerPoint with you. This is a favorite photo, an image that can be found in the households of those who want to Imagine leading a powerful life because right here, Shiva is your own spirit. Shakti is your own capacities to lead the life of courage, the older child, and lead the life of wisdom and remove all obstacles from your path, which is the younger child connection. This is not a family that lives in the mountains. This is your life. This is you. This is your inner family. When understood. Of course, it is also said that if you want happy family life, you can have this image in your home. Next. Next. 